Thank you. That ends general questions and it brings us to our next item of business, which is First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements is planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. In February, I asked the First Minister about the case of 84-year-old John McGarity, who was left for eight hours on a hospital trolley in a corridor, having been admitted with chest pains. At the time, the First Minister said, these things happen in the NHS. His Health Secretary said, it was not a true reflection of the NHS. Can the First Minister tell me, does he know of the number of people left in trolleys is getting better or worse? First Minister. Well, uh, that's not what I said at all. Uh, I remember very specifically saying this government takes seriously any uh, individual case where treatment is less than satisfactory. Uh, that is what we should do, and that, and that is what we, we do. I did make the point uh, that there are very substantial indications uh, that overall treatment in the National Health Service is improving, that patient satisfaction is improving, and also the point which we all should be aware of when we quite properly raise cases such as this, uh, that everyone should be proud of our National Health Service in Scotland. Joanne Lamott. I think he did say it, um, but clearly hasn't reflected on it. Now, I don't dispute we all love the National Health Service. We all care about it. The First Minister and I agree that pensioners like John McGarity waiting for eight hours in a trolley in a corridor for treatment is a disgrace. I presume when I raised this with him in February, he investigated occurrences like this. So I'll try again. Can he tell me, has the situation got better or worse? First Minister. Well, I, I can tell John Lamont that the situation in terms of treatment in the National Health Service overall is improving. Uh, and it's improving uh, despite the, the great pressure on all public services, and it's improving because of the commitment and effort of our staff, nurses, doctors and civil staff in the National Health Service. I can give her a range of statistics which indicate that. So on individual cases where, where treatment is less than satisfactory, of course they are looked at seriously, of course they are taken into account. But John Lamont, in pursuing these individual cases, should not deflect on the case that overall treatment in terms of the times waiting for treatment, in terms of the efficacy of treatment, in terms of the number of people being treated is improving in the National Health Service. I, I think that is an enormous tribute. To, to the staff and the commitment of our National Health Service in what are inevitably difficult times. Joanne Lamont. You know, I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever the First Minister can give me a long list of answers to questions he wasn't asked. <laughs> but he hasn't answered the question I asked him. And this is not about anybody running down the NHS, it's about taking our job seriously. Because I can only presume the reason the First Minister doesn't know is because he doesn't care. He hasn't even asked. He hasn't even asked. Perhaps he does not like to ask in case the answer breaches his perfect view of his world. So let me tell him what is happening in the NHS. He is supposed to be running between deciding what currency a fantasy Scotland will have in his fantasy world. In the real world, in the real world, the number of people languishing in A&E is increasing. And we know that thanks to a freedom of information request in our health boards. In John McGarity's area of Glasgow, the number of patients who waited over four hours to be seen has more than trebled, going up from 10,100 in 2009 to 31,700 this year. Let's look across Scotland. In NHS Lanarkshire, the Health Secretary's own backyard, the number of patients waiting more than four hours in A&E has also more than trebled. In Grampian, the First Minister's own backyard, there was a 1,300 increase in patients waiting more than four hours in A&E compared to last year. Now the First Minister knows what's happening in the NHS on his watch. Will he tell us what he's going to do about it? First Minister. Order, First Minister. Isn't that exactly why the Health Secretary announced the plan for reinforcing the staff and resources at accident and emergency units across Scotland so that winter pressures can be sustained and the position can be improved? 
They, well, that is what the Health Secretary has announced because that is the correct response to the pressures we have seen over this winter. Uh, the capacity of our accident and emergency units has substantially increased under this Government. The number of treatment diagnosis and treatment carried out in hospitals and A&E departments are up by 6 per cent since 2006-07 under this Government. And that has been able to be done because the resource budget of the National Health Service in Scotland has increased under this Government, despite the extraordinary financial pressures imposed on us from Westminster. We know that would not have happened had the Labour Party been in power. And we know that because the Labour Party would not commit either in 2007 or in 2011 in the run-up to the election to protect the budget of the National Health Service. And we also okay. know it because the only place that Labour are in power in these islands is where there has been a real-term decline in National Health Service funding. And that is a reality. So let's answer the question in this sense. That where pressure comes on the National Health Service, this Government responds by devoting additional resources to accident and emergency, so as we can treat real patients with real conditions and sustain the health service against winter pressure. But I don't think a party which was unable to commit itself to the health service in the election campaigns and is unable to commit itself to the health service in Wales now is in any position to pose as a defender of the National Health Service yeah. when they wanted to spend that money elsewhere. Joanne Lamont. We would settle for the First Minister answering the question in any sense whatsoever. That certainly does not qualify. And to talk about Wales, you are in power here. You have been in power here, responsible for the NHS. I'm sure you do understand you have been in power since 2007 dealing with the National Health Service. And on this point, and on this point about winter pressures, the winter pressures this year were less than in 2010. So the explanation around winter pressures simply does not stack up. Now, if the First Minister ever made it out of Butte House to the real world and met a patient, met, met a patient waiting for treatment on a trolley, we can assume that the First Minister would reflect as the person is lying in front of them and say, listen, you are more satisfied with NHS than ever before. The First Minister would tell the person lying in the trolley, things are better under his area of responsibility. He is simply not serious. When will he understand that patients need medical treatment, not slogans? He has been in charge of the NHS for six years. In that time... Well, not thank goodness for the people lying in trolleys and the First Minister. The First Minister tells them they should be grateful for that. Not thank goodness at all, because in that time, they've been waiting for more than four hours in the A&E. It's increasing, but what does he do? Instead of cutting times, we can hardly believe this, instead of cutting times, he cuts the target. And I have raised this issue with him time and again. And isn't it the case that the reason things have got worse, the reason he has done nothing to improve the situation, the reason he doesn't even know is because he doesn't care about the NHS patients. He only cares. He only, and they also only care. They also only care. They also only care about SNP slogans. Well, here's a phrase which sums up... Order. You might want to ask your own guy for an answer occasionally, and that would be... Order. Through the chair. Then we will really know we're in a new place. However, while here is a phrase which sums up this country, here is one, and he should reflect under in this country, under Salmond, Scotland, Scotland is lying on a trolley while his referendum is an in intensive care. First Minister.
What did our First Minister? It, 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 did, it did strike me as I, I, I was listening to that that folk being treated now in Monklands in Air Hospital accident and emergency. <laughs> that their hospitals wouldn't even be there if it had been left to the Labour Party. Not content okay. with not securing the budget, the Labour Party were going to cut the hospitals. Yeah. And perhaps what is more important than Joanne Lamont's view of the National Health Service is what the people think about the National Health Service. 85% of Scottish inpatients reported that overall care and treatment was good or excellent on the inpatient survey. 88% of people are very or satisfied with the local health services in 2011, up from 81% in 2007. These were the issues, of course, which were tested at the 2011 election, which is why people vindicated the SNP's stewardship of our National Health Service and left the Labour Party languishing in opposition. Now, of course, John Lambert says we shouldn't talk about what's happening in Wales. Why don't we talk about what's happening in Wales? Because it indicates what actually happens when the Labour Party are in power. We're in a position now of fierce cuts from Westminster affecting both the Welsh and Scottish budget. In Wales, they decided to cut the health budget in real terms. They were under financial pressure and couldn't see the commitment to maintain the health service budget in Scotland. In Scotland, this government decided to maintain and sustain the resource budget of the National Health Service in real terms. So when it comes to political commitment, not only in the record of this government or the National Health Service, vindicated by the people in the 2011 election, but also in the financial commitments that have been made, the National Health Service in our hands is the reason, above all, why we are in government and the Labour Party are in opposition. Number two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, no plans in the near future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, First Minister. This week, a diagnosed psychopath and triple axe murderer who killed a fellow patient in Carstairs, a nurse and a police officer was set free. Thomas McCulloch was told that he would spend the rest of his life in jail. But thanks to a human rights appeal, he's once again walking our streets. I know that nothing can be done retrospectively in this or in any other historic case, but what has the First Minister done to ensure that in future, as in England, when such, a, when such vile and, and vicious people are given a whole life sentence, it will actually mean life? First Minister. Well, the, the terms of the uh, release of prisoners is a matter for the Scottish Parole Board, uh, and that is for them under legislation, if I remember correctly, under the 1993 Act, and it's not for, for ministers to intervene in the decisions of the parole boards. The parole board makes these decisions. Their decision to do it under independent status is protected by statute. A statute passed, incidentally, uh, while the Conservative Party uh, were in power. Uh, so I think, and I'm glad that Ruth Davidson acknowledges that retrospective uh, decisions couldn't be made anyway, but I'm sure she understands and is not suggesting that we should compromise the independence of the parole board, or if she has a specific proposal, uh, then let her come forward with it, and of course it will be considered by the Justice Secretary. Ruth Davidson. Thank you very much. I thank the First Minister for his answer. I note that he's this time saying that it's the parole board's uh, reasoning for this. The problem is that I put the same question to the First Minister in November of 2011, and back then he used EU human rights law uh, as an excuse for not having whole life tariffs in Scotland. Yet, last January, 16 months ago, the European Court of Human Rights ruled on this, and they upheld the principle of whole life sentences for the most dangerous offenders. Since then, we've seen William Keane get just 22 years for the brutal murder of an 80-year-old woman in Perth, and, Sa and, and Saeem Agul, Fazli Rahman were given only 23 years after attempting to decapitate their murder victim in front of a 12-year-old girl. And had the SNP acted in the first term of their government, we could have been certain that Colin Coates and Philip Wade, who tortured Linda Spence to death, would never have been freed. The SNP has had six years to take action. 
Whole life sentences are clear and unambiguous, yet they were absent in last year's Criminal Cases Act, legislation described by Professor James Chalmers as, and I quote, a tortuous system barely intelligible to lawyers, let alone the general public. It's simple. Life should mean life. So will the First Minister give an assurance today that he will finally take action to give the public the protection they deserve? Will he ensure that in the most extreme cases, when the most violent criminals are taken off the streets, they will never return? First Minister. The, uh, Ruth Davidson uh, you know, seems to think I'm uh, inventing the, uh, or bringing the parole board uh, in as a defence. So I've just looked up the 1993 Act. Uh, and I was right, it is a 1993 Act, and it was an Act passed by a Conservative government. Quote, all life sentences prisoners are entitled by law, including those convicted of murder, to have the suitability for release on parole considered after the expiry of their punishment part of their sentence. That's from the 1993 Act. And then, Scottish ministers are required by law to accept any direction of the parole board to release a, a prisoner. So what I'd say to Ruth Davison is this. I am perfectly, and the Justice Secretary is perfectly willing and able to consider suggestions that come forward in a constructive sense. But it does someone ill uh, to come and complain about the law and the relationship of the law and the parole board to release of prisoners when it turns out that the exact provisions under which the parole board has acted were carried into law by a Conservative government. Yeah. So at just some point in these uh, questions about the judicial system of Scotland, which ignore the extraordinary success in having the lowest re level of recorded crime for over 30 years, having the best public satisfaction in terms of people's personal feelings of safety that we've had for many years. At some point, if there are complaints about the judicial system of Scotland, would the Conservative Party acknowledge that the things they are complaining about are the very things that they enacted when they were in government? Question number three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First uh, Minister. Issues of importance to the people of Scotland. The Deputy Prime Minister is in Essex today promoting the UK Government's expansion of nursery education to thousands of two year olds. In a place like Aberdeen, the First Minister is restricting plans to around 40 children. Under the affordable plans that I put to him, 1,040 would secure a nursery place in Aberdeen. Isn't it a shame that so many two-year-olds in Essex will get help, but those in Aberdeen won't? Isn't it a shame that he can't go anywhere in Scotland and make that sort of commitment? First Minister? Uh, well, I have to say, uh, Willie Rennie has surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> it's taken him some considerable time, but he's absolutely surprised me. I, I thought when I was wondering about his question today, the one thing he would not ask about uh, was childcare. And this was because I, I heard the reports of uh, Nick Clegg uh, on the radio this morning. Now, as members will know and reprise, uh, for some time I've been cautioning Willie Rennie uh, about telling us that what's happening south of the border uh, is absolutely fantastic and ideal. Uh, and Willie Rennie has said that that's not the case, it's the thing we should aspire to, and he accused me of being the roadblock, the roadblock on achieving this in Scotland. But it turns out this morning that the roadblock in England is Nick Clegg. <laughs> because he has said and indicated to the Conservatives that he will block government reforms to adult child ratios and child care. And his veto, it said, will jeopardise the entire child care package. Because Nick Clegg has finally paid attention to the points I've been making successively <laughs> to Willie Rennie over the last few weeks when I've warned him that the dilution of ratios poses a severe danger to the quality of provision. So I'm now in the position of having converted his party leader <laughs> to the points I'm making. At some stage, I shall manage to convert Willie Rennie. Willie Rennie. I anticipated that the First Minister thought that I would ask this question. I wonder, I wonder if there will ever be a week in which the First Minister doesn't use an excuse to do nothing, absolutely nothing for two-year-olds. The First Minister seems to be taking a leaf out of the Homer Simpson book. Homer Simpson, Homer Simpson said, 
If something's hard to do, then it's not worth doing at all. It's quite remarkable, it's quite remarkable, while the UK government battles, battles to improve the life chances for two-year-olds, the First Minister does nothing. He does nothing but raise the white flag. He's got excuse after excuse for doing absolutely nothing. It's good for two-year-olds in Essex. Why is it not good enough for two-year-olds in Aberdeen? First Minister. This is, this is kamikaze. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it, the point that Nick Clegg's making, he thinks it's not good for two-year-olds in Essex to be lowering the quality. And the UK government are not battling to expand childcare at the moment. They're battling with each other. <laughs> but, because Nick Clegg has said he shall block the changes because he is concerned, I think rightly so, that the diminution in quality is going to do severe danger to the childcare system in Scotland. I understand that Mumsnet has been campaigning on this issue and he has paid particular attention to the views of Mumsnet. So myself, I could claim the credit. Mumsnet perhaps have been influential as well. Arthur, at please. some stage, whether it's myself or Mumsnet, perhaps we can get through to Willie Rennie that there is a problem in England. His party leader has identified it. It might be wise for a time at least for him to reflect on that before he tries this particular line of argument again. <laughs> Question number four, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the implications for Scotland are of the Queen's speech. First Minister. Well, yesterday I think what we were looking for from the Queen's speech was an indication that the Westminster Government realised the seriousness of the economic situation facing the country in terms of the lack of growth in the economy and indicating that there were going to be new measures to deal with it. Not only was that not in the Queen's speech, uh, but there was a dropping of progressive measures in terms of minimum pricing for alcohol. There was no legal commitment to overseas aid, despite repeated promises. And I think overall, that speech would indicate why this country needs good government from uh, this parliament, as opposed to bad government from Westminster. And the bell -ewing. I thank the, the First Minister for his answer, and, and certainly uh, yesterday proved that Westminster isn't working for Scotland. Does the First Minister agree that, particularly in these tough economic times that people are facing, what we need to see is a UK government which is actually focused on delivering jobs and prosperity for Scotland, rather, rather than pandering in a blind panic to the threat of UKIP after last week's local elections south of the border? First Minister. Well, I think that uh, analysis about the UK government's uh, response uh, is widely shared uh, among political commentators and indeed uh, politicians at, at Westminster. And it would be unfortunate because I think the real issues that are emerging were not contained in the Queen's speech yesterday. The real issues that are emerging uh, are what's happening in terms of the new spending review uh, which is currently being prepared at Westminster. The Institute of Fiscal Studies said yesterday, quote, the current government's plan, Westminster that is, is for eight successive years of tax increases and spending cuts. That's from the Institute of Fiscal Studies. And so it seems that the, the choices facing Scotland are clear, because we've heard so much from the no campaigners on the Labour and Tory side about the uncertainty of independence. Here is a certainty of UK government, eight successive years of tax increases and spending cuts on the Scottish people. Brief supplementary, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Allow me to cheer up the First Minister and his backbenchers just a little bit. The, uh, Briefly, the, please. the National Insurance Contributions Bill was in the Queen's speech yesterday, and this got a big thumbs up from the Federation of Small Businesses, who said it was a shot in the arm. Yeah. What is the First Minister's view on the National Insurance Contributions Bill? First Minister. Oh, I support uh, measures which uh, bring people back uh, into employment. The point I was making... The point I was making for an economy which is severely suffering from a clear deficiency of demand where there is huge unspent resources in the economy, where there are many skills and people who are lying idle, then not to address that fundamental question seems to me a failure of leadership and a failure of stewardship. And to be anticipating, given the real term cuts, as uh, the member well knows, of 8.2% already in the Scottish budget, to be talking about eight successive years of tax increases and spending cuts is a dismal prospect, which I think will encourage many, many people uh, to think twice 
about continuing Tory rule from Westminster, where we can mobilise the resources and people of this nation and build a prosperous and socially just future. And also briefly, Neil Finlay. Yesterday, the UK Government dropped plans to regulate the lobbying industry. Does the uh, f uh, First Minister think that was a mistake, and does he support plans to regulate the industry in Scotland? First Minister. Well, if the, the member brings forward the ideas for plans, we'll see how they're appropriate uh, to the work of, of this Parliament. I think it should be said in general that this Parliament operates in terms of a greater degree of transparency than the Westminster Parliament, having served in both. Uh, I'm in a reasonable position to judge that. But if the member brings forward suggestions in a positive fashion, then they'll be treated in a positive fashion by this Government. Thank you. Question number five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister whether the reported comments of the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing that we are still going to need the same number of beds, the same number of hospitals, the same number of doctors and nurses just to stand still in relation to an ageing population reflect Scottish Government policy. First Minister. Well, the Cabinet Secretary, and I have the full quote here, which Jackie Bailey hasn't used, was talking about the population of over 75-year-olds being set to double and made the arithmetic point that if we were able, through better treatment at home, to reduce by 50 per cent the level of hospitalisation, then the automatic calculation follows. I think yesterday the Cabinet Secretary announced development of the new bed planning tool, which will draw on the expertise of NHS staff and planners to ensure that health boards have the right type of specialist beds in the right places at the right time to meet patient demand. Jackie Bailey. Um, I think the First Minister should be advised that the bed planning tool has already been renamed the bed cutting tool. Alex Neil made the promise of the same number of beds, the same number of hospitals and the same number of doctors and nurses to a unison conference just two weeks ago. The following day, his civil servants were running around, forced to clarify and reinterpret his comments. Yeah. Yesterday, not one single backbencher defended his comments. So can I ask the First Minister, did Alex Neil actually mean what he said? Or was he simply expressing his view in terms of the debate? First Minister. The, uh, I heard uh, an interview with Jackie Bailey uh, on the radio yesterday. I, I, I pay close attention to Archer. Jackie Bailey's interviews, uh, and even in the context of the uh, hospital-acquired superbug capital of Europe statement, her claim yesterday that we didn't need a helpline, the National Health Archer. Service, a confidential line, because under Labour it wasn't necessary, was an absolutely extraordinary statement. You see, under the Labour Party, the number of beds in the National Health Service, acute beds, fell every single year when the Labour Party were in government. And that happened not just because uh, of the inability of Jackie Bailey to remember what happened when Labour was in power, uh, but of course, as the Health Minister Andy Kerr said in 2007, there are good reasons for reductions in acute bed numbers. Medical advances continue to reduce lengths of stay associated with the many planned procedures, and some are now routinely carried out. Well, I see that that Andy Kerr has been reduced to invisibility in the lexicon of the Labour Party. In that case, let's talk about Richard Simpson, who is still here in June 2011, who pointed out that he was exceptionally pleased at the recognition of the Cabinet Secretary that the balance of care could result in a reduction in the number of acute beds on the 8th of June 2011. So it ill behoves Mr. the Smith. superbug expert of this Parliament to come along, forget entirely what happened under the Labour Party, sweep to one side the changes in balance in medical care, ignore entirely that this party committed itself and has delivered the real term increase in health funding, that because of her inability, no doubt, to convince her colleagues, the Labour Party never promised in Scotland and have certainly not delivered in Wales. Question number six, Margot MacDonald. Apologies, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recent Foreign Affairs Committee report on the consequences of Scottish independence. First Minister. Well, I, I, I thought uh, some of the uh, Committee's report was eminently sensible. Uh, for example, when I quote we do not doubt that Scotland as an independent country could play a valuable role in Europe, uh, unquote. However, it should be said that not everybody was convinced by uh, the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee. Uh, the Tory MP Douglas Carswell said 
I can think of lots of good reasons from his perspective why Scotland might want to vote to remain part of the United Kingdom, but the Foreign, Foreign Affairs Select Committee report today is certainly not one of them. <laughs> Michael MacDonald. I am surprised that the First Minister was surprised, presiding officer. I do not know what he expected from such a committee at such a time. However, what struck me was that far from being, uh, having an interest in Scotland, really, which it was meant to have, this report ended up being absolutely fraught with anxiety about what would happen to the reduced status of the rest of the United Kingdom when Scotland becomes independence. And they were certainly talking about the reduced post-independence position, the UN Security Council, the G8 and the European Union. But I wonder if he agrees with me that that's not anything that should influence us when we come to vote in the referendum. Our job is not to prop up a, an ailing power. It's to secure the future for our children. First Minister. I think it's a very solid point. I mean, I, I should just uh, clarify for Margaret MacDonald. I wasn't surprised by the overall negative tone of the no campaigners who wrote the report. One would expect that no campaigners would write a negative report uh, about Scottish independence. I, I, I thought what was interesting is within that overall uh, volumes of negativity. There were one or two nuggets of common sense. That's the bit that surprised me. I mean, well, actually, I mean, Margot's quite right. I mean, Mingus Campbell uh, on the radio uh, said, uh, I heard on your news bill in a moment or two it's been dismissed if I were in some way partial, that it was written by people whose interest was to argue against the independence of Scotland. That's quite true in my case. <laughs> uh, so, so as a, a member of the committee, Ming seems to have uh, agreed with, uh, with Margot's analysis. But the other point she makes is equally substantial. Uh, the report focused virtually entirely not on the interests of Scotland, but the major points it seemed to make was what would happen uh, to the terms of the UK's prestige uh, in the world. Uh, and here I think they make a fundamental mistake that prestige and influence in the world uh, is not based on size. Uh, it's not based even on military intervention. The military intervention in Iraq, for example, did not enhance the UK's place in the world. The UK's place or Scotland's place in the world to be will not be governed by that. It will be governed by the quality of our ideas, the strength of our social services, the health of our economy, our ability to make a positive contribution to humankind. These are the things that matter, not the baubles of prestige which the Foreign Affairs Committee concentrated upon. Thank you. That concludes.